become the witch or wizard you want to be as you leave your unique mark on the wizarding world. Here, in Hogwarts Legacy. What's up, wizards, witches, and muggles? I'm Damon Hadfield, and I'm here with Alan Tu, the game director on Hogwarts Legacy. Welcome to IGN Fan Fest. Hi, happy to be here. So how does it fi- how does it feel to finally have this game out in the wild? Uh, it feels a little bit surreal. <laughs> um, I, we've been working on this for a really long time. Yeah, yeah, but uh, but uh, I'm in, I'm kind of a, in proud papa mood. Mm. Um, I'm really happy with the team, and this was a real labor of love for us to the fans, and so it's. It's kind of a, an exciting to finally see them be able to interact with it and and to start kind of like seeing what the what the reaction is from from everybody that we made this for. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. So Hogwarts Legacy takes place in the late 1800s, which is as far back as we've seen a story go in the Wizarding World. <laughs> what are the most notable ways the game expands on the lore of this world? Uh, I'd say right up front, people are going to notice um, the different faculty, um, mm-hmm. different students. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, there there are some familiar faces just because of the nature of the the property, so mm-hmm. you know, nearly headless Nick or uh, the Red Baron, like different different ghosts from the environment. Um, Peeves is in the castle, mm-hmm. so fans can look forward to seeing Peeves, who wasn't didn't appear in the movies but was in the books, a mm-hmm. poltergeist that haunts the school. Um, I'd say the biggest difference is Headmaster Black. I think we were a little bit mischievous in choosing this time period. Mm-hmm. Um, we're all familiar with Dumbledore being kind of like the the kind figure at Hogwarts that kind of takes Harry under his wing at really important moments. Mm-hmm. And Headmaster Black is almost the polar opposite of Dumbledore. <laughs> uh, he's voiced by Simon Pegg, and he's known in lore as the least popular headmaster the school has ever had. And we just said, okay, that sounds fun. Let's, yeah. let's put it in that time. So while the game is set long before uh, the mainline Harry Potter series, it's actually only about 30 years before the Fantastic Beasts series. Mm-hmm. Are there any references to those movies in the game? Um, not specifically, although there are lots of creatures, uh, like basically the different ways that those movies expanded lore, we tried to embrace all those elements because mm-hmm. anything, that, anything that we could do to kind of create touch points of authenticity, um, but then also be able to interact with things that you've seen. Any of the work in the Wizarding World was something that we wholeheartedly embraced. Well, since this is FanFest, we sent out some owls and they've brought back a few questions from our audience. Starting off with a question from Jartasm. In the game, you kill countless people and creatures. How are you still a good guy? <laughs> I think, like other video games, there's a little bit of suspension of disbelief. We're really keen to to make sure that who the bad guys are definitely feel like the bad guys, and they're the only ones that you know you're engaging with combat in. Um, we obviously venture into like unforgivable um, curses, and for us, it was just important for that to feel a little bit different. So there are things that kind of soften the blow of combat in our game. You know, like the way that we bodies kind of wisp away or mm-hmm. that type of thing. Um, but they're, they're, they kind of fit within what fans will know from other games. Um, but I think with Unforgivable Curses in particular, we're just really, it was really important for us to make sure that uh, fans could dabble with it, that they could experiment with what that meant. Hmm. And then they're handled with a lot of care in the quest structure, just to make sure that the gravity of them and the feeling of them uh, felt correct hmm. according to the world. So I think whatever you experience maybe fits within the normal range of games, but, uh, but when you dabble into the Unforgivable Curses, we try to make sure that the world was reflecting back um, the way you would expect it to, given the gravity of those spells. Sure. And Dell Treasure asks, what is your favorite area in the game? I, I really adore the common rooms. Um, mm. Some of them have never been seen before. Um, and there's something about, uh, you know, I'm a proud Ravenclaw, and so I've got my Ravenclaw pride. If, if you catch me, I'll, I'll go straight to, you know, I am a Ravenclaw and I get to my common room and I love it. But I played the game as every house and mm. And whenever I imagine uh, coming in, each one has something kind of special and unique about it. And every single time I've I come to the common room in the game, I just the music hits you. We design special music for each location. There's like a certain nostalgia that it hits, a certain magic that it hits. And as you sit in there and you kind of go, "Oh, I'm finally here," it's just uh, it's just it's kind of an incredible feeling. <laughs> yeah. So, players in Hogwarts Legacy each get their very own room of requirement to do with as they will. As you shared with us a look at yours, we've been digging through it and we'd like to ask you a little bit about it. Okay. So in my room of requirement, um, I wound up discovering the importance of light, you know, if you're going with a dark setting, but also the power of lights. So even though the daylight stuff is very naturally, intuitively likable, um, I love being able to highlight different things with the lamps uh, in the setup. And coming in, I really wanted like a big centerpiece that would kind of catch your eye, which is the unicorn right up front. <laughs> And then as I go along, you'll see uh, on the right side, 
I tried to set up sort of like a gaming corner. Mm. Um, that's more of a vibe place. <laughs> um, here we've got uh, the desk of description, which is how you identify different kind of uh, unknown gear throughout the course of the game. You'll keep coming back to the room of requirement in order to, to figure out exactly what the gear that you've earned in the game does. Um, but I wanted that to feel like a real study area. In the loom area, I wanted a real kind of, that's where you're kind of tweaking your gear. So I wanted kind of like this fashion thing. I've got the little, <laughs> I've got the little, uh, I don't know what they're called, the little thing that kind of like high do privacy hmm. and the panels and then uh, the mannequins. And then this was sort of my, my lounge area where everything's just kind of chill and you can see the animating portraits on the walls that I put up. <laughs> and all that was just to kind of like vibe out. Um, there are different vivariums that will unlock over the course of the game that you wind up bringing your magical creatures to. Well, it seems like there's a real incredible attention to detail. How much of the space is customizable and how do players go about you know, filling that space? Yeah, um, the space, like the, the floors, the walls, all those have different kind of um, presets that are immediately accessible. So you can change the ceiling, change the, the lighting in the room and get a different look right away. And then all of the objects inside of it that you can hang on the walls, the banners, uh, the carpeting, and the different objects that you see inside of it can all be scaled and placed and put wherever you want. In the game, we have, I think in development, we refer to them as recipes, uh, conjuration recipes, but I think in the game, they're forward facing as spell crafts. Um, those are things that you earn a few different ways. Um, there's a shop called Tomes and Scrolls in Hogsmeade where you can purchase different conjurations. A lot of those are really focused on practical items though, which you're seeing right here. Mm. These are uh, the different planter tables where you're growing um, different seeds uh, for magical plants uh, that can be used either in, as potion ingredients or even in combat. Um, but a bunch of the other uh, spell crafts for the decorations, those are things that you will discover in something that we call uh, either as rewards for completing your field guide or things that we call collection chests in the game which we kind of keep track of on your map as you're going through the game. Um, there are a few different types of collections too. It's kind of a, a nice tip for everybody that not all the collection chests are tracked. Um, there are a few conjurations that you can find in each of the vivariums. I think each of the vivariums are hiding three collection chests in each of them. Hmm. And then there's also a kind of special event out in the, uh, out in the highlands uh, where you can, you can track um, these, uh, <laughs> these kind of magical butterflies through the environment that also lead to conjuration chests. Mm -hmm. But I feel like that's useful for folks to know because we track everything but those. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Well, I think we're seeing a lot of craftable and consumable potions in there. Mm -hmm. How would you, what do you say is the best way to optimize the room of requirement for use as a resource during gameplay? Yeah, I feel like, uh, I feel like that varies a little bit. This one you'll see like a, uh, a little bit between aesthetic and, and usage, but I've got all the plants, which many of them feed into the potions on the right. And a lot of that is just kind of, we have small planter tables, we've got medium medium planters, and we've got large planters, and different seeds fit in different things. Um, but mostly uh, there's a limit to the number you can have, and then uh, the players can earn enough money to kind of buy planter tables of different sizes. So to begin with, you might have one just with like three, mm -hmm. but they can get up to sizes of five for mm -hmm. small planter tables. And then that's just uh, an increasing cost. Um, so it's kind of up to gamers how they want to approach it. If they really just kind of want to ramp up their production quickly, they can go with the increasing sized ones. Or if they're a little bit like me, I save and just go straight for the big, one, the big planter tables. Like you're, you're providing some real pro tips here. Yeah. Like straight from the game director. <laughs> uh, as for the beasts, how, how important is it to play with various beasts, interact with them throughout the game? Uh, interacting with them, playing with them, that's how you um, gather beast byproducts, things like feathers and mm -hmm. different things. So. Um, you always want to, whenever you come in, there's, you'll want to feed and brush your beasts. You play with them. Uh, you can see uh, this kind of play, oh, you, the, little, the little fella, we had a little accident in there as we're moving the stuff around. But um, over each of the creatures, you'll see kind of like a, a heart and, and uh, the knife and fork there. And that represents whether or not they're well fed and, uh, and happy. Mm -hmm. And so you'll brush them and you will feed them whenever you enter. And each time you do that, you'll be able to extract another byproduct. And there's a timer that sits on them before you might do it again, just so that you're not just kind of sitting there hammering on it. And you also have reasons to return back. Um, but yeah, th that, simple, that simple task of just kind of brushing, brushing and, and feeding is how you wind up uh, getting the resources you need to feed into the loom. Well, it looks like that's about all the time we have here. Thank you again, Alan, for stopping by, chatting Hogwarts Legacy and all things Wizarding World with us. You can play Hogwarts Legacy now on Xbox Series X and S, PC and PlayStation 5, and later this year on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and Nintendo Switch.